Recording in progress. Okay, good. Okay, so let's get started with a word of prayer, and then we'll get into Job's big week of pain and suffering. Who would like to open us in a word of prayer? I will. Dear God, be with us tonight as we study your word. Um, thank you for all the bodies that are here participating and um, guide what you have for us to hear. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Martha. So the little bit of homework that I gave you guys last week, and I think Matt announced this on Sunday morning, was just to have read Job chapter three. And if, if that's all you did, then that's awesome. If you only thought about reading Job chapter three, that's fine too. We're going to start with just reading that. But before I do, what I want to talk about a little bit is the way we're going to be looking at Job and his experiences. And I'm going to set down a couple assumptions for us to work with tonight. Now, I know that you've probably heard like that whole phrase about what happens when you assume you make an ass out of you and me kind of thing. Well, in... in Criticism of a text and analysis, making assumptions is really, really, really helpful because it gives you a couple foundations to stand on as you're kind of working your way through a particular passage. And we talked about the book of Job being of a certain genre last week. Does anybody remember what genre it is? It, wisdom. Right, wisdom. And there's some debate about whether or not Job was a real person, or if this is just sort of, you know, expressing a point of view using a really well-known myth or legend at that time. What we're going to do is we're going to set that stuff aside tonight. I want to assume that Job is a real person when we're reading this. Whether or not he is, that doesn't matter. But when we're tackling these passages and when we're tackling the stuff he's talking about, I think it's really helpful to assume that he's an actual human being who is really going through this stuff. And the reason I want to make that assumption is because I think we're going to get a lot more out of the text by making that assumption because it allows us to examine Job's psychological state. Again, I'm saying this not just because I'm a psychologist, but I think that this allows us to humanize Job in a way that's going to be really helpful for us as the readers. This brings me into the second thing I want to talk about. And what I'm going to do real quick is share my screen. We introduced theodicy as a concept last time. We're going to have another major theme we're going to look at this week to go along with what Job's talking about. And that theme is trauma. So let me talk a little bit about trauma here. Let me go ahead and share my screen with you guys. Now, can everybody see the screen okay? Yes. With the triangle on it? Yes. Fantastic. So let's talk about trauma first. I'm going to go ahead and highlight the definition here. And this is a very basic working definition of trauma that is something that therapists and psychologists will use. The idea here is that trauma is an emotional response to a terrible event. So it's the way that you react to or the way you respond to something awful that has happened to you. And we commonly see trauma discussed when we're discussing accidents, when we're discussing sexual assault, when we're discussing people's reactions to natural disasters. Now, I'm not gonna dig too deeply into those because I, I think we kind of already established Job's traumas last time, right? <laughs> Um, I think it's pretty clear that he has been through some really, really hard things. And when I've been reading this book, I've found that by looking at Job through a lens of trauma, it really helps explain some of what he's saying and maybe helps us better understand why he's saying the things he's going to say when we look at this, these passages tonight. Let me take a quick peek here at some of the common signs of trauma. Again, this is just intended to just be like a quick five minute introduction to the concept. Very often when someone's been through a trauma, they will often experience emotional shock, sometimes manifested as sort of denial or disbelief that they've gone through something. Now, 
when we talk about denial as a concept, sometimes people think of that, uh, oh, please leave that light on. There's a reason that it's on. Oh, okay, that one back, okay, sorry. Sarah's making some adjustments to the room, sorry. Um, so there's a reason very often that we talk about denial and it's not just kind of rejecting reality. Sometimes denial is also kind of wishing that things had gone a different way or imagining a life that is different where the trauma had not happened to that person who's gone through it. Confusion, difficulty, concentrating are also very common, having a hard time thinking about anything apart from the trauma itself or having the trauma sort of break into your daily experience as you're trying to concentrate on other things. Anger, irritability, mood swings, guilt, shame, and self-blame, withdraw from others, feeling sad or hopeless, and feeling disconnected or numb are also really common. Now, how many of you have heard of these things being associated with traumas before? Sure. Some, I see some head nodding going on. Okay, so this stuff is probably not super new, if it is new. So this is stuff that you hear discussed a lot whenever the concept of trauma is brought up. But I want to take it to one additional level here before we get into the text itself. And I want to introduce you guys to what we call the cognitive triad of traumatic stress. This is a model that we use in psychology to try to understand how a person responds to a trauma that's happened to them. And I think this is in particular going to be really useful for us when we look at what Job is talking about in the text tonight. And you'll see that it's sort of broken down into this nice, helpful triangle with these three little components connected to it. We have, first of all, at the top of the triangle, views about the world. So when you experience a trauma, the way you see the world around you is changed. And you can and here are just some example statements of these just below this. The world is a dangerous place. People cannot be trusted. Life is unpredictable. And the reason we call this the cognitive triad is because when you have a trauma, it changes your cognitions or the way that you think about the world around you and also the way that you think about yourself which is where we're going next if we work our way down this leg here on the cognitive triad. Views about yourself change as well. People will have some of these common statements like I am incompetent. I should have reacted differently to the trauma. This is a really common thing for people who've been through it. They sometimes blame themselves and think that they should have done something different in response to it. It's too much for me to handle feeling overwhelmed or unable to process what has happened to you that's also really common with traumas and feeling like you have been damaged or harmed or broken in some way is also common as well. Finally, we have views about the future, which I'm gonna move over to next here. Feelings like, I don't think I will ever be the same or I feel like things will never be the same, that there's no going back to the way that things were before the traumatic experience happened. That's gonna be a big thing for Job and we'll get into that. Questioning what the point of going on is or sort of wondering if there will ever be a chance of getting over or moving beyond the trauma itself. And also feelings of hopelessness are really common with this as well. Now, again, I'm not here to like dive into like a really deep complex therapy session with Job. But I think that this model is really useful because the stuff that's happened is so awful. I think it has a huge impact on the way that Job is going to perceive these three things, the world, himself, and his future. So I just wanted to lay this on the table. And I want you guys to kind of grab some of these things and pay attention to them as we read through the different texts that we're going to play with tonight. Are there any questions about any of this stuff, this little information dump that I've sort of laid before you guys before we shift gears back to Job himself? So is trauma the event or the response to the event? Correct. That was a question. And that was my answer. You're correct. Oh, okay. <laughs> Got it. Sorry, I missed that. It's okay, both. So that's, that's different than what I perceived you trying to say at the beginning. Go ahead, John. Uh, you were saying that trauma wasn't the event, it was how we responded to it. 
that's just one definition. Psychological concepts have multiple ways to try to define them. And when you define what a trauma is, again, we're looking at the traumatic event, which is sometimes called a trauma, but we're also looking at the emotional response to the trauma as well. Does that help a little bit, John? Yeah. Okay, good. This is so, I took a picture because this is all what I need for like trauma informed education and all this. I mean, like, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> no, no, we have no. students who are dealing with a lot of this stuff. That's right. We're, yeah. I mean, we are living through a massive cultural trauma right now. Uh, this is something that my field has been discussing a lot. We view the entire pandemic as having a massive impact, uh, sort of in a traumatic fashion for a lot of people who are living through it. And honestly, would, I'll be really flat with you guys or direct with you guys about this. Uh, our students are struggling a lot with this, mm -hmm. especially our younger students. Mm -hmm. Any other questions about trauma before we take a look at the passages? Great. So what we're going to do is, as we sort of open things up is I'm going to read Job chapter three. And given, uh, so I, I've put these ingredients here on the table and I just want you to listen to the words and see how often these things, these changes to Job's worldview, his self view and his view about the future, how they're going to pop up in the different texts that we read. Okay. So to start us out again, let's, I will, I will just read Job chapter three. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the days, the day of his birth. And Job said, let the day perish on which I was born. And the night that said, a man is conceived, let that day be darkness. May God above not seek it, nor light shine upon it. Let gloom and deep darkness claim it. Let clouds dwell upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. That night, let thick darkness seize it. Let it not rejoice among the days of the year. Let it not come up into the number of the months. Behold, let that night be barren. Let no joyful cry enter it. Let those curse it who curse the day, who are ready to rouse up Leviathan. Let the stars of its dawn be dark. Let it hope for light, but have none, nor see the eyelids of the morning, because it did not shut the doors of my mother's womb, nor hide trouble from my eyes. Why did I not die at birth? Come out from the womb and expire. Why did the knees receive me, or why the breasts that I should nurse? For then, I would have lain down and been quiet. I would have slept. Then I would have been at rest with kings and counselors of the earth who rebuilt ruins for themselves, or with princes who had gold, who filled their houses with silver. Or why was I not as a hidden stillborn child, as infants who never see the light? There the wicked cease from troubling. And there the weary are at rest. There the prisoners are at ease together. They hear not the voice of the taskmaster. The small and the great are there. And the slave is free from his master. Why is light given to him who is in misery? And life to the bitter in soul. Who long for death, but it comes not and dig for it more than for hidden treasures, who rejoice exceedingly and are glad when they find the grave. Why is light given to a man whose way is hidden, whom God has hedged in? For my sighing comes instead of my bread, and my groanings are poured out like water. For the thing that I fear comes upon me, and what I dread befalls me. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. 
I have no rest, but trouble comes. Let's just soak that in for a second and let's just take 30 seconds of silence to just marinate in Job's words. Okay, by my count, that's about 30 seconds. All right, I'm sure you guys have some thoughts. What's popping into your heads after we've heard this? Just your first reactions. It seems like he's over in the self corner of the triangle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's really struggling with his view of himself. So what, were the, what things related to his view of him, himself have, has been affected by this? What do you guys see? There's a kind of sense of worthlessness. He should have never been born. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Honestly, he takes this notion of cursing to a whole different level. I've never heard anything quite like this. Mm -hmm. It's just amazing. I think he's about as low and as depressed yes. as he can get. Um, by implication, he has no future then, too. I mean, there, the future should not even exist, or, you know, there is no future. Right. Since I should have never been born. If you were to offer him a future, do you think he would take it? Not in his condition. Okay. He would rather die. That's the future he wants. Right. It, my, my first thought was it, it seems more human than last week when he just was like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. A hundred percent. I completely agree, Becca. This is, I, I kind of, uh, I my cards on the table, I'm kind of a fan of poetry, Job. When you get into these passages full of poetry, he has some really heavy, I mean, he's not a happy guy, mm -hmm. but he definitely seems more human in a very, very visceral, real way here, for sure. These are certainly points he has no control over at all. He was born. You can't help it. Right. Exactly. And if you, that kind of touches on the views of the world point of the triangle as well where life is unpredictable, the world's a dangerous place, and, and very often that lack of a sense of control over events can be connected with traumas as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that extreme hopelessness and not being able to handle it, just it's beyond. Yeah, way beyond. <laughs> very much, yes. If he has a little bit injustice too because in my bible the last verse says i was not fat and lazy yet trouble struck me down yeah and that understand what's going on it, you're you're exactly right art and that will pop up if you get into any of the other following chapters in where job continues to repeat his complaint that idea comes up that he did nothing wrong and that's going to become a really big theme for us going forward you're absolutely right. Any other thoughts? He saw death as a way out because yeah. death, death was kind of the, a non-existence, more or less. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you're absolutely right. For them at this time, especially if we're talking about ancient Jewish beliefs, um, they didn't necessarily believe in an afterlife the way that we did. For them, death was just a cessation of existence. And there are different passages in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, that will allude to that belief 
for instance, there are passages that say things like the dead do not praise God. And it's that, that kind of falls in line with that, that sort of thinking. What Job is asking for here is not to die and go to heaven. He just wants to not exist. Right. Well, he keeps mentioning, you know, being quiet, being asleep, being at rest. You know, I mean, it's, it's almost peaceful to him just yeah. to think about not existing. Yep. If, let me throw this question at you guys. If we had, if you had a friend who was talking like this, would you be worried about them? Yeah. Oh, yeah. If, I mean, I, so speaking again, sort of as a psychologist and a professor, I've had students who have had suicidal ideation and thoughts before. And that, that if I was assessing Job the way I had assessed those students in the past, I would be trying to get him into an involuntary hold right now. Because I would classify him just on the basis of this chapter as really, really high risk for committing suicide. Mm -hmm. So Job's not in a good place. And we talked about his three friends last week. No matter what we may think about them, we'll be getting to next week. It's really, really good that they are right there with him. Because one of the things you're not supposed to do is you're not supposed to leave someone who's suicidal alone. So points to them for sticking around and at least fighting with him after he says this, instead of just kind of going, okay, bye, and like wandering off, right? So we can at least give them some points for that. This is just the warm up. I have so many little passages and, I'm, and we're probably not gonna get through all of them, but I wanna try to give you guys as big of a cross section of Job's complaint as I possibly can, because it evolves. It starts out here in this very, very dark place but it begins to change as he repeats it and as he argues with his friends. And some interesting things begin to show up. Let's jump to Job chapter six, verses four through 13. Job chapter six, verses four through 13. You ever had that moment where like you have two pages in the Bible that are stuck together and they're like really, really hard to get apart? I'm having that right now, sorry. There we go. Who's got that for us? Chapter six, four through 13. I can read. Sure. For the arrows of the almighty are in me. My spirit drinks their poison. The terrors of God are arrayed against me. Does the wild ass bray over its grass or the ox low over its fodder? Can that which is tasteless be eaten without salt? Or is there any flavor in the juice of mallows? My appetite refuses to touch them. They are like food that is loathsome to me. Oh, that I might have my request and that God would grant my desire that it would please God to crush me, that he would let loose his hand and cut me off. This would be my consolation. I would even exult in unrelenting pain, for I have not denied the words of the Holy One. What is my strength that I should wait? And what is my end that I should be patient? Is my strength the strength of stones or is my flesh bronze? In truth, I have no help in me, and any resource is driven from me. Now, let's pause for a second. As you're looking at this passage, has anything changed compared to what we saw in chapter 3? What, what's a little bit different here? Well, it appears. Go ahead, Bruce. It appears that he's he's not blaming God, but he's he's kind of drawing God into the discussion right. that, you know, that this is something that is that God has brought upon him for some reason. He's recognizing that. Yes. And how much did he mention God in chapter three? I don't think he did at all. Yeah. Maybe like once. 
Well, and, at the very um, beginning, right add above, not seek it. So all of a sudden, he starts to bring God into the discussion. What, okay, what does Job want from God here? Relief. <laughs> he wants some answers. He sounds very impatient to me. Mm -hmm. He wants some relief. He wants some answers. Um, but, and what, but, and, 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 go ahead. Isn't, it, isn't death a relief, though, or a release? Uh-huh. He wants to be crushed. Yeah. Uh-huh. So we're still a little suicide -y, right? Just like a little, a little bit. But he's looping God into this discussion. Are we still seeing signs of trauma? Yeah. Yeah, everywhere. The, the triad is in full effect. Any specific details pop out to you guys? Well, I think um, it's telling when he says, uh, it talks about, um, do I have the strength of stone? Is my flesh bronze? In other words, am I Superman? Can I, can I go on tolerating this? I mean, he's really kind of drawing it to its logical conclusion, right? Right. He's had, he's had this, these horrible things happen, and then these horrible things happen to him personally, and he's, he's uh, just going... This is this is not sustainable, right? That's the I can't handle it, right? Thanks. I just I want to be done. I want to be dead. Kill me, God, please just kill me. <laughs> God, what he's saying here, right? Is anybody else have like a slightly different read of it? Because I'm pretty sure that's what he's asking for. <laughs> yeah. so the the feeling but, of utter hopelessness. <laughs> yeah. We still have no sign of hope other than him really, really wanting God to just sort of take him out of the equation, right? Is, is any of this response because Eliphaz has visited with him and given him an opinion? We'll get into some of that next week, but yes, when, we, when you get, that's why I wanted to start with chapter three, John, because when you get into these later passages that I'm looking at, you're absolutely right. Some of this stuff, this, this is going to be the result of the discussion he has with his friends. So what I'm trying to do is sort of rip apart those passages and get to the core of what Job is upset about. But you are correct. And he'll, um, he'll start to complain more about his friends the deeper we get into that. But I promise you, next week, we're going to tackle his friends and we're going to look at Job's responses to them, which... Some of this stuff is just pure venom. It's really, really entertaining. Okay, hey, what let's about oh, what about ahead. verse? Sorry, you're fine. Oh, go ahead, Vicky. What about verse ten? Yeah, yeah. Where, but it's that? still my consolation that I rejoice, and I rejoice in unsparing pain that I have not denied the words of the Holy One. To right. me, there's a little bit of something different there than just uh -huh. the lament. Well, he continues yes. his 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 purity. You know, he's yes. expressing he's in absolute agony, but he won't turn against God. Right. At least he's saying, hey, I haven't done anything wrong. Right. He's he's making it clear. And th that's why I like to kind of read these in the sequence that I've sort of picked out, because the next one, you're going to see another evolution. His complaint gets clearer. And he edits it and refines it until there are certain themes that keep popping up. Let, actually, because I'm excited to get into this, let's take a look at the next one that I've picked out, Job chapter 7. And this is just two verses, 20 and 21. Can anybody pull that for us? Job chapter 7, verses 20 I can. and 21. You got it, Bruce? Yeah. Um, all, right. all right. If I have sinned, what, what have I done to you? You who see everything we do, why have you made me your target? Have I become a burden to you? Why do you not pardon my offenses and forgive my sins? For I will soon lie down in the dust. You will search for me, but I will be no more. Hmm. Okay, who's he talking to? Uh, the Lord. Uh, I'm Does this seem a little bit more targeted than what we saw in chapter 6? Yeah, 
Uh, my version calls God, you watcher of humanity. Yeah. Like he's just watching us. He's not, mm-hmm. you know. <laughs> yeah. Yep. You're just like kind of sitting back, just kind of, oh, you're having a hard day. Oh, so sad. I'm going to get my popcorn. Like, and it's sort of like a, a distant view, right? Possibly even suggesting a lack of empathy or a lack of connection between God and humankind, which is a disturbing thought, right? What else sticks out about, and again, I know these are just two verses, but you can begin to see again this message come forth. What else sticks to you, uh, out to you guys? He's trying to get his head around, why did this happen? I mean, yeah. it's just, uh, it's unfathomable. Yes. Not a sinner, you know, he hasn't distanced himself from God. So he's right. trying to make sense of it, which is a little bit different than just an, an emotional response. He's mm-hmm. kind of pulling his brain back into it. Yeah, he's trying to figure it out. I, I like the way the English Standard Version renders the beginning of verse 20. If I sin, what do I do to you, watcher of mankind? It's kind of like, yes, yeah, so what if I sin, if I did something wrong? Why are you bugging me about it? <laughs> he's sort of asking him, why are you concerned about this? Like, even if I have sinned, you're God, why does that take anything away from you if you sort of read it like that? Yeah. And it's a bold thing for someone to say, right? It, borderline blasphemous if you were to bring that up in some denominations, yes? It's going to get more entertaining. Let's jump down to Job chapter 9. This is a little bit of a longer passage, but it's worth it. Verses 13 through 22. 13 through 22, Job chapter 9. Anybody want to volunteer to read this one? It's a fun one. I will. Go for it, Rosie. God does not restrain his anger. Under him, Rahab's helpers sink down. How then can I answer him or choose my arguments against him? Though I were in the right, I could not speak out but I would plead for mercy with my judge. If I summoned him and he responded, I do not believe he would lend me his ear for he crushes me for a hair. He wounds me much for no cause. He does not let me catch my breath, but sates me with bitterness. If a trial is strength, he is the strong one. If a trial in court, who will summon him for me? Though I were not, though I were innocent, my mouth would condemn me. Though I were blameless, he would prove me crooked. I am blameless, blameless. I am distraught. I am sick of life. It is all one. Therefore, I say, he destroys the blameless and the guilty. It's a good punctuation that dog bark right yeah. at the end. <laughs> because that's a great that's a great reaction. Because I mean, when you're reading this, can you imagine? Let's say you've had somebody who's spent most of their life in the church just reading the New Testament, and then they find this and they read this passage. Can you just imagine them popping their heads up and going, "Whoa!" and like backing away from Job, waiting for the lightning strike to hit him. Right? How is Job? thinking about the justice of God here. He's angry. Yeah. He's getting mad. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes, he, he is. There doesn't seem to be any justice of God. <laughs> yeah. He's kind of saying that, I mean, I, I love this passage here. Um, it is all one in verse 22. It is all one. Therefore, I say he destroys both the blameless and the wicked. <laughs> wow. He, so it sounds like God is not really being fair in Job's mind, correct? Mm-hmm. Again, let's go back to that triangle for trauma. When we're talking about someone's views of God, especially in the ancient world, that's going to be their worldview, correct? Mm-hmm. Has Can we make an argument here that Job's view of how things work in his world has radically changed? That whole people can't be trusted. 
can I really trust God? Correct. He's having some significant trust issues here. This is, a, like I said, I mean, this is kind of a fun one because there, there's, Job has so many barbs. He just wants to hurl <laughs> his listener. Is there anything that sticks out to you guys here about this particular passage, especially stuff that maybe sounds different from any of the prior stuff we've read? You see his point of view evolving? Well, he seems, to be, he seems to be looking at like a broader concept so it's that where he says um, he destroys both the blameless and the wicked. So he's, he's kind of pulling back and it's not just so much about him, but, you know, this is kind of what God does. Yeah. Like this is this is now his view of the world. This is the way that God works. God just destroys us. Is he still kind of want to die? I understand how he can say. I, I don't understand how he can say I have no concern for myself because he's he's got to be concerned about himself. That's Well, and that kind of relates to the question I was just asking. D does Job still sort of sound like he kind of wants to die? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I loathe my life. Yeah. 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 So in that light, John, is that a useful way to unpack that? sort of thinking of it as he just doesn't have any more sense of self-preservation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at, ooh, this is a fun one. Let's look at Job chapter 16, verses 12 through 17. Job chapter 16, verses 12 through 17. I can read that. Go for it. Six, um, here I sit, here I sit in sackcloth, and have laid all hope in the dust. My eyes are red with weeping, and on my eyelids is the shadow of death. Yet I am innocent, and my prayer is pure. Is that it? Was that sixteen twelve? Uh, it started with. Uh... She started oh, at 15. Yeah, you I, need to start at 12. Yeah, okay. start at 12. Sorry. That's okay. Was, it's from the living, or living Bible. Uh, I was living quietly until he broke me apart. He has taken me by the neck and dashed me to pieces, then hung me up as his target. His, air, his archers surround me, letting fly their arrows so that the ground is wet from my wounds. Again and again, he attacks me, running upon me like a giant. Here I sit in sackcloth and have laid all hope in the dust. My eyes are red with weeping and on my eyelids is the shadow of death. Yet I am innocent and my prayer is pure. That's 17, was that where you're supposed to end? 17 is perfect. And honestly, I like the way that the, the Living Translation rendered some of that. That really hit home pretty great. Our version is so much more gory. Uh -huh. I mean, I like it. Lashes <laughs> open my kidneys. Yes. <laughs> or like mine says, I've sewn sackcloth upon my skin. Like I sewed the sackcloth mm -hmm. into my flesh. Yeah. Like, ooh. And, but I like the, the subtlety of artist translation where it talks about how the ground is wet from his wounds. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, wow. So think about the, I want you to kind of look at the, the words, the, the nouns and the verbs that Job is using here, because he's trying to describe God with, if you kind of look at this passage and allow a picture to form in your head, of the thing he's describing, what does it look like? And, and God is an abuser. <laughs> Violent. Okay. And abuser. Abusive, violent, right? It's, I what mean, that? What, broke, seized, dashed, slashes, pours, bursts, you know, I mean, That's all of those verbs are crazy. They're really uh, violent. Not only is God violent, he's intentional about it. Correct. Right. Cruel, cruel. That's that's the word. That is the word, Bruce. Cruelty. This violence 
for almost for sport is cruelty, right? And in contrast to that, he's pure or his prayer is pure. But I haven't done anything. I'm yeah. fine, right? And he's just like, I didn't do anything. I mean, you got to find some worth somehow, somewhere, if the whole world, even God's against you, I guess. Who else do you turn to? Right. So and here's my question. Is Job getting darker hmm. in the way he's portraying his complaint? Yeah. Yeah, because it went from just analyzing the, the physical circumstance I'm having a really, really bad day to um, God isn't even protecting me to God is the one doing this to me. Right. And I haven't done anything wrong. Right. So you give yourself permission to lash out if you see yourself as somehow better than the circumstance. Correct. Exactly. So because Job doesn't think he's done anything to deserve this, he yeah. is he's justified he's in justified out. in lashing out like this yeah. i mean and this is this is defensive anger mm -hmm. that we're seeing here and you, you guys can begin to see why i think it's so useful to assume job as a full human being as we're looking at this because it, it takes this stuff this really dark heavy stuff and it makes it kind of click in a way that makes sense. Because if you think about, I mean, have you known people who have been this mad about something before? Mm -hmm. Of course you do. I mean, we're human beings who are alive on planet earth. We have bumped into this kind of anger, Mass. right? It, it, this is just part of the human condition. When I look at this, this is one of the strongest arguments in my mind of Job actually potentially having been a real person is the actual psychological depth of this. Or again, whoever wrote it is just a, a has an amazing grasp on the concept of human suffering and really, really understands it. With me so far on that? Doesn't Job oh. doesn't say somewhere, and I don't know where even, that I have sinned, but not to the degree of my punishment? Is that may pop up. Yeah. Um, seems like he does somewhere, but. Me. My memory is not very good, and it's been a long time since I've read this book. So Yeah, and it's, uh, I think that you're right. I think he does bring it up, but at some point, but uh, as you can see, I'm, I have to cherry pick what he said. And I, I have been zeroing in on verses that specifically tangle with his outlook in relationship to himself, the future, and his connection with God. But that may be in there in one of the chapters that I had to skip over, which would be fun activity for you guys. If you want to, when we're done, go look at some of the stuff that I jumped over. It's, it is just as interesting as this stuff is. Now, there's another chapter here I want to take a look at. And this is another longer passage. But again, it's worth it to read this. Let's take a look at Job 19, verses 6 through 22. I know it's a long stretch, but oh, guys. You want to read this, trust me. 19, 6 down to 22. Anyone brave enough to read that for us? Hey, I'll do it. Oh, go ahead. Go, go ahead. ahead. Okay, this is, <clears throat> this is not the living. This is the new living, but uh, uh, I'm liking it too. Anyway, 19.6. But it is God who has wronged me, capturing me in his net. I cry out, help, but no one answers me. I protest, but there is no justice. God has blocked my way so I cannot move. He has plunged my, yeah, plunged my path into darkness. He has stripped me of my honor and removed the crown from my head. He has demolished me on every side and I am finished. He has uprooted my hope like a fallen tree. His fury burns against me. He counts me as an enemy. His troops advance. They build up roads to attack me. They camp all around my tent. How far? Uh, until 22. 
Okay. My relatives stay far away and my friends have turned against me. My family is gone and my close friends have forgotten me. My servants and maids consider me a stranger. I am like a foreigner to them. And I call my servant, he doesn't come. I have to plead with him. My breath is repulsive to my wife. I am rejected by my own family. Even young children despise me. When I stand to speak, they turn their heads, they turn their backs on me. My close friends detest me. Those I loved have turned against me. I have been reduced to skin and bones and have escaped death by the skin of my teeth. Have mercy on me, my friends have mercy, for the hand of God has struck me. Must you also persecute me like God does? Haven't you chewed me up enough? Now, before we discuss this, what I want to do is read for you guys something that I've pulled from the same source that I got the triangle from. This is from the book, Trauma-Informed Care in Behavioral Health Services. And this is talking about one of the features of trauma. Feeling different. An integral part of experiencing trauma is feeling different from others. Whether or not the trauma was an individual or a group experience. Traumatic experiences typically feel surreal and challenge the necessity and value of mundane activities of daily life. Survivors often believe that others will not fully understand their experiences. And they may think that sharing their feelings, thoughts, and reactions related to the trauma will fall short of expectations. However horrid the trauma may be, the experience of the trauma is typically profound. The type of trauma can dictate how an individual feels different or believes that they are different from others. Traumas that generate shame will often lead survivors to feel more alienated from others believing that they are damaged goods. When individuals believe that their experiences are unique and incomprehensible, they are more likely to seek support if they seek support at all, only with others who have experienced a similar trauma. So thinking about it like that, and thinking about the passage that I just read, do you see that in Job's discussion or the, in these verses that Job is talking to us about at all? Do you see him feeling different from others? How so? What's he saying? Everybody's abandoning me. He feels... Yeah. Well, he goes abandoned. through an entire... He goes through an entire list of, of how he is isolated from other people, from his, his, his breath offending his wife. Um, That's my favorite one. He's loathsome to his own family. Little children scorn him. Um, I mean, everybody wants nothing to do with him. I, I picture him being that disease decrepit individual that the children run from out of fear just because he looks so hideous. Right. And that's that's how he perceives himself. It, right. It, it, it strikes me that nothing new has happened to Job other than his friends came by. This is, you know, you, you got the sores and all of the catastrophes up to the end of verse two or chapter two. And now he's just feeling sorrier and sorrier for himself. Yeah. It seems like he's kind of digging himself into a deeper hole. Would you guys agree with that assessment? You feel like he's getting worse? Yeah. And his, his three friends are not helping. No, they are not. <laughs> like I said, they were, they are going to get their own week next week when we deal with them. But it really doesn't seem like they're helping much at all. He, he might have gone this way even without the three friends. 
Possibly, uh, yeah. You know, it's just sitting there feeling sorry for yourself, festering in this uh, situation that he's in. Do you think his friends are doing a good job of understanding his point of view? No. Probably not. And Probably not. Um, spoiler alert, that's what we're going to see next week. But on the basis of this stuff that I just read about trauma and feeling different, one possibility is that when his friends showed up, he feels even more alienated from who he was prior to the trauma happening especially because they're not doing a very good job of understanding what he's been through. This is something that we sometimes see with veterans who come back with combat experience. It, very often veterans want to talk about what they've been through, but they are really, really concerned that what they share may be alienating to their friends or to their family members because of some of the things that they've been through. They're afraid of what their family members will think of them. Does that make sense? And we can kind of see that here with what Job is wrestling with. I mean, it's just a, it, it just kind of keeps getting worse for him, or at least worse in his own head, right? Anything else about this particular passage that sticks out to you guys? So what popped into my head when we read it was the song that nobody likes me, everybody hates me, guess <laughs> I'll go eat worms. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, at this point, I do have like two other snippets that I was going to read with you guys that I thought were really interesting, but it, it's more of the same stuff. Let's establish a couple things right now here. Who is Job think who who does Job think is responsible for his plight? God. God. Like 100 percent He he thinks that God did this to him. Does Job think he did anything wrong? No. Um, no. Not at all. Again, spoiler alert, his friends don't think that's the case. <laughs> they very much believe that Job is has sinned and they are arguing with him about it. So his source of comfort suddenly turns against him. God, whom he has served his entire life, seemingly has turned against him. And it seems like he is just in a place where the entire world is fighting him, right? You think, does that sound like a fair assessment of what you guys have been hearing tonight? For fun, let's turn to James chapter five. I didn't misspeak. We're going to take a peek at the New Testament real quick because I am a huge fan of tonal whiplash. Let's take a look at cha James chapter five, verses seven and 11. Let's see if I can find it. Five, seven. Seven and 11? Uh, yeah. Seven, eight, nine, 10, and 11. Oh, seven, seven through 11. 11. Yeah, seven through 11. Do you want me to read it or? Yes, please, Matt. Be patient, therefore, beloved, until the, the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious crop from the earth, being patient with it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also must be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord <laughs> is near. Beloved, do not grumble against one another so that you may not be judged. See, the judge is standing at the doors. As an example of suffering and patience, beloved, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Indeed, we call blessed those who, are showed, who, who showed endurance. You have heard of the endurance of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Does that fit with what we've been reading at all? Not yet. Passionate. Mercy doesn't seem to, does it? <laughs> mm -mm, doesn't, but patient what? endurance, no. <laughs> first, the first two right? chapters, yes, but after that, no. <laughs> right. So, when the reason I'm pulling these verses into the, the discussion here is very often you'll see the, what every once in a while, I should say, the New Testament authors will mention Job. And when they do, it's almost always like this. 
where Job is like this stalwart, patient person who understood that God knew what he was doing and never complained. But it, it just doesn't really seem to match up very much with the person that we just read about, correct? It just doesn't seem to fit. And I've always been really, 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 really confused about that. So I did a little research. And as it turns out, again, the, the whole thing about Job being a widely known story means that there are different versions of that narrative uh, apart from the book of Job that would have been known to the New Testament authors. A common mytho a cultural mythology about who Job was that did not always line up with what we see in the actual book of Job itself. There are some New Testament scholars who've suggested that when you see the New Testament author is referring to Job as a good upstanding fella who always did, like, like they're, they're talking about the cultural version of Job. They're not necessarily referring to the book of Job itself. Does that make sense? So, which helps me kind of go, oh, good, <laughs> because it means that they're not, it's not that they read the book and then came to a wildly different conclusion about everything. It's just that the story of Job has a lot more sources or uh, there are more versions of it out there apart from the, the text that we actually are dealing with tonight. Is that helpful? On some yeah. level? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Matt. There's, there's one thing it makes me think of, and, and I'm just going to throw it out there. I, I haven't really researched a lot myself, but Jeremiah, there's some passages in Jeremiah where Jeremiah gets, you know, really, um, you know, takes God to the mat. <coughs> and um, it sounds, you know, there's a lot of similar sounding stuff. And I, you know, I feel like there's, there's some element in, in this, not that you want Job to stay here, of course, but there's something almost redemptive or healing in, in, in it, in its, you know, in its honesty. And yes. So I just want to hold on to that, you know, and you're absolutely right. And that's kind of where I was going to try to aim here a little bit as well. The thing is, Th this stuff is hard, but there is, like you're saying, there is value in being this honest with God about something. It's really helpful whenever you're looking at Job and you hear all of this really heavy stuff to look at how Job ends in some ways, because between the friends who were blaming Job for his sin and Job who's complaining this loudly about everything, who did God ultimately say was correct? Job. Oh, mm -hmm. here's what that gives us it gives us the opportunity to be honest with god about what we're going through with some of the things that have happened in the last few years uh, especially with the pandemic and some of the political strife that's happened in our country and hey some of my own health issues you guys know that i've been through a lot recently there have been moments where i have been furious with god and when in my experience, especially because I became a Christian later in life, I started really going to church in high school. One of the things that I heard from a lot of people around that time was that it really wasn't okay to be angry with God or express anger to God, that it was sinful to do that somehow. And I kind of bought into that for a long time until I really dug into what Job has to say. And he is an example of somebody who was very raw and very real with God and put everything on the table. He didn't have to put on a happy face saying, oh, I'm a believer and everything is going to be fine. He instead is extremely transparent about what he's dealing with. And that kind of honesty, that kind of allowing yourself to be mad, allowing yourself to be open about things, allowing yourself to be weak, and to not have all of the answers, I genuinely think is an important lesson to learn from this book. In that sense, Job's emotional honesty with God is probably the most valuable thing he brings to the table. And if you take a look at God's response to Job, saying that Job is the one who spoke honestly and correctly amongst his friends, I think that may have he has some part to do with God's response to that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. 
Now, let's kind of review because we're it's 8.03. <laughs> I want to be respectful of your guys' time. Based on everything that we have read tonight, how would you describe Job's complaint against God? What is he saying? If you were just to boil it down into one sentence or maybe one or two sentences. I don't deserve this. Yeah. I don't deserve this. Yeah. God, yeah. you're not fair. Why, why are you doing it to me? Right. Why me? Why is this happening? I didn't, I, I don't deserve this. And I think also, God, you are not just. Yeah. The, the, the things that are happening is not just. Right. So he's questioning the justice of God. He's questioning why this happens. And again, with some of the things that we go through, that, that is a very real place that a lot of us go. One of the things you may have noticed that I do whenever I preach, it, whenever Matt makes the horrible mistake of allowing me to be up in the pulpit and say whatever I want, <laughs> uh, I focus a lot on things that make people doubt and stuff that I think people struggle with in terms of their faith, because the theodicy questions and the questions uh, of faith are really important to me. This is stuff that I struggle with. Whenever it comes down to the question about why awful things happen and is God actually really just to allow these horrible things to happen to really, really good people, I always keep in mind the actual physical incarnation of Jesus Christ. And this is the last thing that I really, really want to say I, I, I was going to write it down in my notes, but I forgot to. How did Jesus respond to people who were suffering when he encountered them? What, what did he do? Any example works. Great compassion. He's compassionate with them. What else does he do? He healed them. He heals them, right? He pr or provides for whatever they happen to need at that time. Is there anything else he does? He sees them. He sees them for who they are, right? And anything else? Goes toward them and lets them know that they matter and they're important and he's not repulsed by them. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you guys a weird homework assignment. I want you to maybe go back over some of the stuff we have read tonight. And I want you to use what I've heard preachers sometimes before call your godly imagination. I want you to imagine how Jesus would respond to the things that Job is saying. Think for a second what that might be like. You think he would fight back with him? You, you mean as if Job is directly addressing... talking to Jesus and Jesus okay. is right there. Jesus is sitting right there with Job and his three friends. How do you think Jesus would respond to this? And what would he say to Job? It's a big, it's a little bit more difficult than just read chapter three of Job. <laughs> because I really want you to stew on it. I want you to think about it. I want it to bother you. I want you to put some work into it. Because I think if you do it will produce some really, really valuable results. And that's all I have for you guys for this week. Would you join me for a quick word of prayer? Lord, thank you that you did not just sit idly by and watch us suffer. Thank you that you actually took on our sufferings and joined us down here on earth so you could share suffering with us. And thank you that when we suffer, we don't have to lie to you about what's happening in our lives, that if we're mad, we can be mad. If we're disappointed, we can be disappointed. And if we're hurting Thank you that we can be open about the fact that we're hurting. Thank you that you understand trauma better than anyone. And thank you that your response to that was to come down and love us and share that pain with us. As we go through this week, please help us to be mindful of the kindness that you have given us. 
and with whatever comfort we have received from you when we have gone through things like Job. Please help us to take that comfort and share it with other people. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.